In this video, I will give you one perspective on why eigenvalues and eigenvectors are so important. The conclusion that we'll come to is that eigenvalues and eigenvectors, or the spectrum of the linear transformation as they're known collectively, tell us everything we need to know about the linear transformation. They reduce the linear transformation to its bare essentials and are able to communicate all of the relevant things about that transformation in the least amount of information. So how are they able to do so? Well first, let's talk about how many eigenvalues and eigenvectors there are. Well, we've experienced different scenarios. We have seen some linear combination, some linear transformations with as many eigenvalues and eigenvectors as the dimension of the space. We've seen uh, transformations with fewer eigenvalues and eigenvectors than the dimension of the space, namely the derivative when it came to the space of polynomials. And finally, we saw linear transformations like the rotation in the plane with no eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But we never saw linear transformation with more eigenvalues and eigenvectors than the dimension of the space. That's very easy to prove that there cannot be more. And the reason for that is that eigenvectors that correspond to different eigenvalues are linearly independent. It is very easy to show and I will do that in another video. But because they're linearly independent and there cannot be more linearly independent vectors than the dimension of the space, there cannot be more eigenvectors than the dimension of the space. So there cannot be more eigenvalues and eigenvectors than the dimension of the space and that's what we've observed. Now in many cases there are exactly as many eigenvalues and eigenvectors as the dimension of the space. Sometimes we have to double count. For example, if the dimension of the corresponding eigenspace is more than one, then we count that eigenvalue twice and we pick two or more, however many we're able to, linearly independent vectors from the eigenspace corresponding to a single eigenvalue. So that allowed us to double count eigenvalues in a good sense and that allowed for more uh, transformations to fit the pattern that there are exactly as many uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors as the dimension of the space. Now there will be one, uh, I don't want to say unfortunate, but an unexpected exception where the eigenvalue will count more than once, but there is only one eigenvector to go around. And we'll have to, that will be called a defective case. And we'll have, we'll I'll give you special examples of defective linear transformations. And those cases will have to be dealt with differently. All right, but now, Let's focus on the situation, on a transformation in which all of the eigenvalues, in which there are as many eigenvalues and eigenvectors as the dimension of the space. So then we have n linearly independent vectors, the eigenvectors, in, a linear, in an n-dimensional linear space. So they necessarily form a basis. Remember, when the number of linearly independent vectors matches the dimension of the space, and it's necessarily a spanning set. It can deliver any other vector in the space by a linear combination. And it therefore forms a basis. And it's perhaps the best basis that you can choose if you're analyzing a particular transformation. We're getting to that theme that the choice of basis is up to you and it's dictated by your problem. Well, if you're considering a particular linear transformation then that linear transformation may dictate a choice of the basis. That basis may be more convenient that, than other basis, bases. Choice of basis is a very important subject in linear algebra and all of applied mathematics. And we're now finally getting to talk about it. What may dictate choice of basis? And if there is a linear transformation involved, then choosing the eigenvectors as your basis is a very good choice. Here's one example. Let's consider a three-dimensional space. I'm not even saying what kind of space it is. It could be geometric vectors, could be polynomials, could be vectors in Rn, could be any other space. But let's assume that it's three-dimensional. And then there is a linear transformation T 
that's central to the problem and that and that that linear transformation has three eigenvectors e1 e2 and e3 i'm not putting little arrows above the vectors because these may not be geometric vectors and we reserve that notation for geometric vectors in a book i would have made these symbols bold but on the board we'll just have to keep track of which symbols represent vectors and which symbols will represent numbers of course those will be the alphas the greek letters okay now suppose that we have we're considering some vector v and this linear transformation being so central to our problem of course we want to know what is the image of v under this transformation and now that we have this basis why not decompose v with respect to this basis so now v will actually be given by its coefficients alpha 1 alpha 2 and alpha 3 now we're beginning another major discussion in our subject which is the component space so this representation of a vector by its coefficients with respect to a basis called the component will be a representation of this vector in component space and component spaces will occupy a very large part of the remainder of the subject obviously the component space is where all of the computer action takes place because in component space everything is numbers and it's only numbers really that computers are really good at so that's why we're choosing a basis that's why we may be decomposing some vector with respect to this basis now we want to evaluate the image of this vector under this transformation and because the transformation is linear when I apply it to the entire right hand side it will end up applying to E1 applying to E2 it's very nice that T has a skinny bottom and to T3 why is that? well this is due to linearity when we apply T to the entire right hand side before T was in there it's being applied to a sum and when it's being applied to a sum it can be applied to the individual terms of the sum and then the results could be added together so now you can imagine that t was being applied to the whole expression now it's split into three terms where t is in front of the alpha and applies to both alpha 1 and e1 but of course linearity dictates that there's that second property that it doesn't matter whether you multiply a vector by a number first and then apply the transformation or the way we had it originally transformation was applied to a number times a vector the order doesn't matter so we can bring it inside and we would do it for each one of the three terms and so uh, we would have this expression and the main takeaway from this expression so far it has nothing to do with the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of this transformation is that if we know what happens to each of the basis elements to each to each of the vectors in the basis then we know the entire transformation that is a very important takeaway that specifying what the linear transformation does for the basis vectors alone is sufficient to specify what it does for any vector why because then you would just take that vector decompose it with respect to this basis transform each one of the uh, basis vectors and then rebuild the linear combination with the same coefficients and there you go you have your image of the vector v that is true for any basis so that's why bases are so important that's one way to reduce a transformation to its somewhat bare essentials and that is to specify what it does for every basis element a very important idea in all of linear algebra that's why bases are so important if you know that applies not only to linear transformations but all sorts of going ons in linear algebra if you know what happens to the basis you know what happens to the entire space now let's consider that very special case where we choose eigenvectors chose eigenvectors for our basis vectors well then we know exactly what t of e1 is it is lambda 1 
E1. So it becomes alpha 1, lambda 1, E1, plus alpha 2, and of course lambda 2, the second in value, E2, plus alpha 3, lambda 3, E3. And we see now that the image of the vector V, V, which had coefficients alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3, its image has coefficients alpha 1, lambda 1, alpha 2, lambda 2, and alpha 3, lambda 3. So in component space, but only when that component space is constructed with respect to a basis consisting of eigenvectors, carrying out the linear transformation, no matter how complicated it is, couldn't be any easier. The recipe becomes just multiply the first coefficient by lambda 1, the second coefficient by lambda 2, and the third coefficient by lambda 3. So having an eigenbasis, which is a basis consisting of the eigenvectors, and knowing the associated eigenvalues tells us everything about the linear transformation. With just those three pieces of information, maybe six, three of them are vector pieces of information. So three numbers, so knowing three numbers and three vectors, we can now apply the linear transformation, no matter how complicated, to any vector whatsoever. How? Decompose the vector with respect to the basis. Multiply each one of the coefficients by the appropriate eigenvalue. And those are the coefficients of the image. Just rebuild the image of the vector through this linear combination and you are done. This is probably the most important reason why eigenvalues and eigenvectors are a central topic in linear algebra.